Hi everyone, it's Jeff Challen. Um, so this is, I guess, the fourth part of our uh, screencast series for Simon Zero. And what we're going to do this time is look at Git. Um, I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. I don't really uh, want to provide a lot of, of help with Git. Uh, we will certainly help you guys in office hours and other places. But the reason for that is that Git is so well documented online at this point. Uh, and the tutorials that you can find there are going to be way better than anything. That, than, than we could provide, uh, certainly anything I can provide it in this sort of format. Um, but the number one thing I want to encourage you to do uh, is right here, read the output and error messages generated by Git commands. That is so important because Git produces amazingly useful output. I have had several times where students have come to office hours and they said, you know, I've been struggling with Git for the last couple of days. And, um, you know, here's the error message that it's giving me. And you look at the error message and the error message tells them exactly what to do to solve the problem. Um, and so, you know, don't waste your time like that, you know, uh, read the output. It's always important to read the output uh, from, from commands, especially when things go wrong and, and Git will frequently read you and lead you sort of in, in exactly the right direction. Okay, so um, down here in the tool chain section, let's, let's just, you know, I just want to do like one of these exercises and the one that I'll pick, um, is one that showcases one really neat feature of Git, uh, of Git, which is branches. Um, so, so Git branches are designed to be extremely lightweight and they're designed to be a way for you to, um, organize your development. So a lot of, a lot of people don't really realize, uh, when they get started with Git, what branches are for, but branches are a great way to, um, develop a feature, make sure it works, and then integrate that feature sort of as, as a whole back into the main branch without having to, um, while still being able to save your work using commits, but without having to check and code into the master branch, that may potentially not work. So, so let me show how to do that. Okay, so um, I'm in my Vagrant VM, I'm on the master branch. So the first thing I'm gonna do uh, is create a branch. Uh, here's one syntax for doing that. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a branch where we have some code that breaks the boot. So you can see in the default prompt, I've got break boot right here. So my prompt is actually even telling me what branch I'm on. Another way to tell what branch I'm on is to run git branch. Um, and at this point, I haven't made any changes with master, so that diff is empty. So that's pretty much what we would expect. Okay, so now let's let's uh, make a change to our kernel that's going to cause it to not boot, and that'll be kind of fun. Um, the way I'm going to do this, turns out that this is uh, surprisingly kind of hard to do. Um, so I'm in the boot function here. This is the initial boot sequence. And right here at the end of it, let me create, let me generate a null pointer exception. So I'm going to create an int j, and I'm going to set it to the result of dereferencing a null pointer. Why does C allow you to do this? I don't know. Uh, this seems like it could never work out right. Um, and then to, to silence the compiler warning about an unused variable, I will um, I will just write this for J. Okay, I think that will work. Let's go to compile uh, and let's try to build. Oops, uh, I messed up, of course. Compressor can't code. Um, what I need to do is do this for J. Okay. You make... Okay, and let me run do make install. So now I've got a clearly rotten kernel that I've just installed. And, and let's say for the sake of it, um, you know, that, I, that I'm going to commit this change. So, so now let's use git to see what I've done. Um, here's the change I've made. I've added this. Uh, git is complaining about some white space here. Uh, that's something that you uh, can, or, uh, can fix or choose to ignore. Um, and what I'm going to do now is commit this onto my branch. Um, See, let's break the boot. Okay. Oh, whoops. Okay. Um, Got to do this. Just do this quickly. Um, and sorry, I should have run this before. It's not hard to fix. Just want to know who I am. All right. And now let's do this. Okay. Now, um, Git status is going to show us that our working directory is clean, and Git diff with master is going to show the change that we made. So now I have a committed change in this branch. Um, and now let's say that at some point, like right now, I'm going to discover something about my kernel, which I would prefer not to know, which is that uh, it doesn't boot. In fact, it panics. So here's the panic that's caused by the change I just made. Um, it's a, uh, you will probably become familiar with this error message. What this means is that 
uh, tried to dereference a virtual address zero. Um, and this will cause the your kernel by default to enter a position where it's waiting for a debugger to connect to it. Okay, so this is not good. Um, if I ran it without causing it to wait for the debugger, it would just die. Okay, boom, panic. I can't handle this. I think I'll just die now. All right, so now I've, you know, clearly don't, and then maybe, you know, I've got to the point where I have some changes that don't work on that branch. In fact, I do, I have a kernel that doesn't boot. So let's, uh, the first thing let's do is let's go back to our, our let's go back to a, a known good version. So uh, one of the awesome things about branches is it is super easy to switch between them. So I do get check out and get, will actually allow me to tab complete this so I can check out break boot. I can check out master. Um, and that tells me that it's up to date with, with staff master. I haven't made any changes since I cloned this. Okay, so now I'm on the master branch. Now, if I look at kern main main.c and go down into the boot function, you'll find that there is no terrible null pointer to reference right here. And if I go to kern compile and change it to my compile directory, um, I can, this will work just fine. So now I can install a working kernel and run it. Check it out. Cool. Okay, so now let's say that I'm at the point that I, I'm on my master branch and I've decided, you know, I don't, don't like the changes I made in that, in that one branch. I just like to just sort of get rid of them entirely. Um, so I can diff against break boot. I can see the changes. Uh, so this, what this means is that in order to get from my master branch to break boot, I would have to remove these lines from, from break boot. Um, so now the great thing about good branches is that they're extremely lightweight. So I'm just going to get rid of this guy. Um, branch, I think it's dash D break boot. Ah, here we go. So now what Git is going to tell me, here's an example of a really helpful Git, Git error message. Um, so I tried to delete that branch. What Git told me is that you've got changes in there that you haven't merged anywhere else, right? They're not merged into master. And so if you delete that branch, you're going to lose things forever, but that's okay because I want to. And look what Git told me to do. It says, if you are sure you want to delete it, run this other command. So check it out. I don't even have to type anything. I'm just going to use my mouse, cut and paste. Boom, All right? Now, sorry, Git branch tells me I'm on master and there's no other branches and that's awesome. Okay, so there's, you know, example number one. Um, and that's we basically accomplished this particular task. Um, now let me, let's talk about a really common uh, stumbling block for people with Git, which is what happens when a merge fails. So one of the reasons to use Git is that it's extremely good about merging changes to files. Let me show you how that works. So I'm actually, I'm going to exploit, I've got to set this up on the temp directory on my host machine. I'm going to exploit the fact that Git can actually allow me to synchronize with a remote that's located on my local machine. So I've created two uh, directories here. One is called Alex, and I will use Tmux to create two windows. Okay, so here's Alice, and Alice and Bob are sharing a remote. That remote is also located in my temp directory. Um, and they're using that remote to uh, to share their changes with each other, okay? It turns out the private and temp, temp are the same thing, so that's gonna work out okay. All right, so Alice and Bob have one file in this directory, which is menu.c. I copied this over from the OS161 sources, so it looks pretty familiar. Um, and let's let's talk about a common, a common occurrence, which is that Alice edits uh, menu.c. So right now, uh, these files are identical. Uh, you can look, you can see that Git shows that Alice and Bob are currently, their Git branches only have one commit and the commit is the same, okay? So now let's say that Alice and Bob change menu.c. And let's say that those changes are changes that can be merged. So what's gonna, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna have Alice add a comment to the top of the file that says, I'm Alice, all right? And then I'm gonna have Bob add a comment to the bottom of the file that says, I'm Bob, okay? Now, if you were using a dumb system to try to synchronize these files, like for example, Dropbox, uh, this would be terrible because all Dropbox would know is, hey, these two files are different, I don't know what to do. So what would happen is it would depend on whoever edited the file last, Dropbox would save some other version of the file and things would be terrible, okay? But Git is way smarter than that. So here's what's going to happen. Let's say that Bob commits his changes. I'm Bob, and I want to say so in the file. And Alice commits her changes. I'm Alice, and I want to say so in the file. Okay, so now 
um, you know, I should run git diff and I can run git status and I can show that my um, working directory is clean, but my branch is ahead of master. So what does that mean? It means that I've made a commit that I haven't pushed yet to the remote, right? And Alice's branch is going to say the same thing. And if I do git log, what I'll see is that Bob added a commit with this commit ID and Alice added a commit with this commit ID. Okay, so there are now two Alice and Bob's uh, repos have diverged. They have uh, they have divergent changes. And what we're going to do now is show you how Git can actually merge those together. So at some point, somebody, we'll just say Alice here, she's a go-getter, is going to push uh, to the remote. Okay, so she just did that. And what that means is that the remote now has her changes. Now, the remote does not have Bob's changes. So here's what's going to happen to Bob. Oh, no, rejected by the remote, Bob. What did you do to deserve that? Um, what he did is that Alice pushed first. So, and here's an example, again, of another extremely useful error message. What does it say? It says that um, rejected error, failed to push some refs. That means that there were objects in your directory that were not pushed to the remote. Um, and what does it mean? It means that updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you did not have. This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same ref, which we just saw because Alice did it. You may want to first integrate the remote changes. Example, git pull before pushing again. There we go. So now here's the thing. So git pull is going to fetch the changes from the remote and try to merge them into Bob's working directory. Okay, so what's going to happen? Nah, check this out. So what git was able to do was that it was able to automatically merge those. So I just used the default commit message. So let's see what happened. Okay. Um, Auto merging menu.c merge by, by the recursive strategy. So what do you think is in menu.c now? On Bob's uh, on Bob's copy of menu.c, he's got Alice's comment at the top and his comment at the bottom. So Git was smart enough to actually be able to preserve both changes to that file. That's why we use Git, right? Okay. Now what's interesting here? Let's look at the Git log again. So now, what is the commit history? So here was the initial commit. This is Bob's commit. This is Alice's commit. And what the merge did is it added a new commit that merged this commit, which was from Bob, and this commit, which was from Alice. That's pretty awesome. OK, now here's the interesting thing. What does Alice's menu C look like? Well, Alice has her comment, but she doesn't have Bob's comment um, because Bob's commit that was added by the merge hasn't been pushed to the remote yet. So let's do a git status. It said your branch is ahead of origin master by two commits, right? Before it would have said one because that was the commit that Bob added, but now there's two. There's the commit that he added and there's the commit that merges his with Alice's. So let's push to the remote. Now it says I'm up to date with origin master. All my refs have been pushed and now Alice can pull and now she gets that commit and she's got Bob's comment. All right. So this is a great example of how Git does the right thing in the common case. When two people edit a file and their edits do not overlap, Git allows those edits to be merged correctly. Okay, awesome. Now let's talk about the other common case, which is let's say that there are overlapping edits to the file. Okay. So now um, let's say that Alice says, I'm Alice and I want to put a comment here. Okay. And let's say that Bob at the same time says that um, Bob also wants to be here. Okay. So now I've got an issue because I've got a comment uh, change by Bob and I've got a change by Alice and those changes overlap. So what's going to happen is this is going to create a conflict. So let me show how that works. Alice checks in her changes. Um, okay. Bob checks in his changes. Okay, neither changes set of changes has been pushed to the remote, so everything's okay. Now, when Bob pushes his changes to the remote, what's going to happen? It succeeds because he's the first person there. Now, when Alice pushes her changes, what's going to happen? Oh, this time Alice gets rejected because again she needs to pull. Now, here's where things get interesting. So last time when we pulled, Git was smart enough to automatically merge the changes. This time. Not so much. So what you'll see here is Git has identified that there is a conflict. Now, the problem is that a lot of times people think that this command has succeeded. It did not, okay? 
Um, in fact, I think it, it returns something that indicates it. Yeah, it returned one to indicate that it didn't succeed. But there's this message here that's super important. Conflict, merge conflict in menu.c. The reason that this has happened is because Git needs your help. Git needs you to figure out what to do with these two commits. There are overlapping changes to the file, and a human has to sort this out. It turns out here that the human is Alice. If Alice had pushed first, the human would have been Bob. Whoever gets the conflict is the person who has to merge it. Um, and what's happened is that Git, Git has left you in a state where you are merging. Um, so it says on branch master, uh, you and origin master are diverged. You have one uh, different commit respectively on merge paths, right? And this is what we're working on. When you're done, so remember before Git automatically created a commit that merged the two changes to the file because it could do that. Those changes didn't overlap. This time, what's going to happen is you're going to make those changes. When you're done, you're going to add the file, commit it, and that is going to mark the merge, right? So if I do git log, for example, um, what you'll see that is that Alice checks in and there's no merge commit because I haven't created one yet. Okay, so what do I need to do here, right? Unmerge pass. So I need to edit the files. Um, here is the helpful message that Git has created for me. What this means is that my head, the head of my repository, has this comment. And here's the content that came in from this um, this uh, commit that I just pulled from Bob's, uh, from the remote that I'm sharing with Bob. So someone has to sort this out. Um, now, the easiest way to do this is to manually edit the file and remove the merge conflicts. Right? If you're looking for merge conflicts in the file, you can look, just look for something like that. Um, okay, so at this point, you've edited the file and maybe you say, we want both these comments to be here. That's good, everybody should be able to comment. Um, so that's one, that's one way to do it. Let me show you another way to do it. Let's say that you know that you want your changes. Um, then what you can do is you can run git checkout rs with menu.c. When I run gets, and now if I open the menu, what's gonna happen is um, all I have are my changes, right? So in this case, Alice has said, I don't care about Bob's changes. I just want mine. And that has removed the, um, the merge conflict marker. If I did git checkout there as menu.c, I would accomplish. Um, I think I can still do that. I would get um, I would get Bob's comment, right? So this is a way to choose between if I want to choose one or the other. Okay, so let's say that uh, Alice is nice and she wants Bob's comment, and so we're done, right? Um, the problem is that when there's a manual merge that has to take place, you have to tell Git when you're done. So in this case, I know I'm done, and I know that menu.c is, is finished, and I've merged the two complex together. Um, so what I'm going to do is do uh, merge done, right? And what you'll see is that um, this has, let's see here. So here's a new commit. Um, now I'm going to, oh, okay, I need to push to the, to the remote. Okay, so now I push two commits to the remote. I run the git log, um, and the menu.c. Ah, here we go. Okay, so I have to run run on menu.c. Um, go over to Bob's repository. He pulls this, um, right? And now you can see what's happened here is that she's chosen. What happened here is because I chose to check out Bob's commit, uh, Git didn't actually create a merge. If I had made changes to both files, instead of doing git checkout there's, um, git would have actually created a new merge tag. Um, so you can sort of verify that yourself by creating a version of the file that actually has both changes in it. Okay, so now uh, Alice has got her changes. Bob's already up to date because essentially all Alice did was discard her checkout and take Bob's, and now I'm in good shape. So this you know, hopefully walks you through two of the common cases, the merge conflict, and the merge that happens normally. And that's pretty much the most complicated thing you'll have to do with Git in this class. Um, but please, you know, be careful, read the, the, you know, Git is an incredible tool, it's super powerful, read the messages that it creates. Uh, we've certainly seen cases, for example, where people have checked in code to the repository that had Git conflict markers in it. And that code, as you would suspect, does not compile and it certainly doesn't run. All right, uh, the next uh, screencast that we'll do, hopefully a bit shorter than this one will be, about debugging using GDP.